So Claymore is definitely adding in a lot of plot threads that are happening all simultaneously, which I like, but it's interesting now to think just how many are going on. So I just finished volume 13, so this is a review of volume 12 and 13, if you didn't read the title for some reason. Uh, so let me just think about this. So we have the original plot thread going on of... Uh, Claire trying to find Priscilla in order to get vengeance for Teresia. So that has always been the underlying plot thread. We also have Claire looking for Racky, and Racky is, of course, with Isley and Priscilla, unknowing that they have any relation to Claire. So they're out there doing their thing. There's also the three top awakened Yoma that were all sort of battling for each other. You had Isley, Lucilia, and Rafel. Rifle? I'm sorry, I'm terrible at pronouncing names. By the way, this series. This is just a this is just a me problem. This series always has like so many characters all there at the same time, and I just cannot keep track of characters' names. So just please bear with me. That's a me problem. Sorry about that. But anyways, you have the plot thread going on between the Awaken Yomas and their kind of three-way battle that was happening there. And then you also have the uh, Claymore organization themselves and the shady shit that they're up to, not to mention the fact that they perfected their number one and number two, Alicia and Beth that we saw that are just like complete monsters. And then they also have this new character that was introduced, at least I, I think it was just introduced in this volume, uh, Miata, which she's a whole other thing that I'll get into in just a moment. So you have that going on. And now you also have a seven year time skip and you have Claire and the rest of her sort of team that is, uh, was hiding in the shadows and stuff. And now they're kind of working outside of the organization. So there are so many things that are happening right now within Claymore that I'm surprised that I read a volume pretty much once a week and I can't actually keep up with everything that's happening. So where to even begin with volumes 12 and 13? Um, well, I guess I'll start with the time skip. So there is now a seven year time skip that happened within Claymore. So the Battle of the North happened, a ton of Claymore died, a bunch of Awakened Ones were there. And at the end of volume 11, it was alluded to that, yes, they all died in the battle. It was a complete massacre, pretty much probably how the organization had planned it to begin with, doing kind of shady shit behind the scenes. But, of course, with Claire being a member of that group, I assume that at least she would survive. But apparently a lot more survived. Apparently, like, a, you know, a good dozen of them survived. So, you know, we also have uh, Miria and, like, a bunch of Deneve, you know, and a bunch of the other Claymore that were there as well. So they all actually survived the battle and were kind of hiding out, suppressing their Yoma energy in the north, pretty much giving it the amount of time that it needed to have the organization just assume they're dead and gone and that nobody was there and that, the, you know, the entire town has been decimated and they've suppressed their Yoma energy this entire time, but they've actually been training sort of their base forms, I guess you could say, consider it that. They're uh, getting faster and stronger within their physical self, which will only benefit them once they awaken their Yoma abilities along with that. And they decided to take this trek towards the south now. Uh, Claire, 100% going to, she believes that Raki is still alive. Which, by the way, Raki was not in volume 12 or 13. And I am desperately curious to see what a time-skipped Raki looks like. I hope he's absolutely a badass. I hope he's jacked the nines. I hope he looks like fucking Kenshiro from Fist of the North Star being trained by Isley and Priscilla this entire time as, like, surrogate family. And now he's just an absolute badass. Though... With the time skip happening, I'm assuming that the uh, the meeting between Claire and Racky, once that finally happens, well, Claire, Racky, and Priscilla, you know, I'm assuming they're all going to meet at some point, will be a very, very awkward moment. Because at this point, Racky has spent way more time with Priscilla and Isley than he ever had with Claire. Now, he has that attachment to Claire because of their history and because of, of her, you know, their original meeting and everything. And so, like, you know, she, at this point, after seven years, would be this vision in his mind of this person that he, like, looked up to and respected and everything. Uh, the same way that I'm sure Claire views... Um, uh, 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 why, 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 why? Uh, Teresa, sorry, god damn it, there's too many names, um, so, so I imagine he's, like, viewing it in the same way, but there's a difference between, like, having, like, a vision of somebody in your mind, my, uh, as opposed to actually spending every day with somebody. Now, I don't know, because, like I said, Racky wasn't in these two volumes, they, they, they might have, like, split ways, something might have happened, maybe Racky's dead for all, and I doubt he would die off screen, but, like, you know what I mean? Uh, but also, seven years is a really long time, so I'm assuming Racky probably knows that Priscilla and Isley are, uh, Yoma at this point, I'd be a little little shocked if he didn't after if they were able to keep it a secret for seven years but you know that has yet to be seen 
Uh, there was also a big battle that was happening in Volume 11 between Isley and Lucilia, who, like, the three, like, main number one Awakened Yomas were uh, Isley, Lucilia, and Rafel, or Rifle. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce her name. Sometimes when I only see names written, I don't know how to pronounce them in real life. Just like when I did my review of Tomi, I just pronounced it Tomi because it's spelled T-O-M-I-E. That just makes sense to me. But everyone's saying, no, it's Tomie. Tomie? Where the fuck was that in the in the manga? Nobody told me how to pronounce it. Anyways, that's neither here nor there. Watch my Tomi review. Uh, so uh, this big battle was happening between Isley and Lucilia, and apparently, like both of them got to the point where they were almost dead, which is pretty much what they would, would consider it to happen if anything happened between these three top awakened Yomas. Is that two of them would battle, and then they'd be completely weakened, and then the third one would come in and sort of take over, you know, kill the weakened one and assert their dominance. But uh, Lucilia does make her way away from the battle scene, and then she meets face-to-face -face with Raphelia, who a big portion of the, the beginning of Volume 12 was about her and her backstory. So Raphelia and Lucilia are sisters, and uh, Raphelia shows up in that sort of weakened moment of Lucilia, and basically uh, it, it cuts away, so we're not like 100% sure what happened. Actually, I think, does Rifle explain it later on? Shit, I kind of missed... I kind of missed that part. But anyways, she, whatever happens between them, whether uh, Raphelia and Lucilia are now both out of the picture, whether, you know, she sacrificed herself to, to kill her, it seems as though that Lucilia is gone. And so now there's only the top two. So uh, later in the manga, when they're traveling south, so we get this scene where uh, Rafel shows back up in her full, like, apostle or <laughs> apostle form, her full Yoma form, uh, starts battling with some of the more recent claymores that exist, the uh, number three and number five that are there now. Uh, pretty much, you know, has a decent fight with them, but then wipes them out, and then Claire and her whole team show up, basically rescue them. And then Claire has this conversation with Rifle, who recognizes her from seven years ago with the battle that they had. And she pretty much explains that, yeah, yeah, this big fight went down. Like, Isley, Lucilia, they had this big fight. Both of them were, like, severely weakened afterwards. I was closing in to make my move, which is what my background image is right there. So she shows up. Uh, which she could kill Isley in this moment, but then she recognizes the power of Priscilla, which is something that, like, none of them had expected or prepared for and whatnot, and she literally turns her backs and walks away because she knows there's no way in hell that she would be able to face Priscilla. Uh, the really cool thing about both of these volumes also is that Priscilla in these volumes, like, literally has no dialogue whatsoever. She's just standing there menacingly <laughs> but it really works to the benefit of the story because like you think uh rifle's there and she's going to close in and and kill isley or attack him or another fight is going to break out and literally uh just like she's so scared that she walks away and the fact that like a number one like awakened yoma uh as powerful as she is and she had her man toy right there next to her as well uh, still would not fuck with Priscilla. So it pretty much shows that Priscilla actually calls the shots. Whether or not Isley presents himself to be uh, to be the leader in this situation, and in my mind, I was always thinking that like they were probably on par, and like maybe Isley was a little bit stronger and whatnot, or you know whatever the case. But this seems to pretty much prove that like no, Priscilla's the one in charge. She might ha have like a very childlike uh, persona but she definitely is the one that calls the shots at the end of the day. So that's a little bit terrifying, but uh, also a little bit sexy. Oh yeah, and then another plot thread that we have going on is uh, Galatia, which I always pronounce that wrong also, uh, is still out there somewhere plotting her own sort of thing against the organization of the Claymores. And to go after her, we have the character of Clarice that was introduced and to take with her, Clarice is a very like low ranking Claymore. Uh, but they do find like some use for her and they want her to pretty much be the uh, the guiding Factor for their new number four, which is Miata or Mieta. I don't know how to pronounce it either. I'm sorry I'm so sorry. There's so many characters. There's so many characters and there's so many names and I'm really really sorry But anyways, both these characters are introduced to basically track down and find Galatia and we have a very we have a very um interesting moment where uh <laughs> <laughs> where uh, Clarice goes in to meet Miata, and not only does she find she's very, like, feral, childlike, but also attaches to her pretty much like a motherly figure, and I'm not talking about, like, just figuratively. I mean, like, <laughs> Mir uh, what is it? Um, Miata, sorry. Miata literally, like, lifts up her shirt and starts, like, sucking on her tit for some, like, mommy milk. And don't get me wrong, I was happy to see some boob suckage in this manga, but this moment 
<laughs> was like very off-putting and I really didn't expect it to happen. I didn't expect it to happen within the scene that it happens in and it's so just like abrupt and in your face and trust me, I love some titty sucking. Like I do, but like I was not prepared for that scene. Um and and it shows that Miata like she really does not have like a personality. Like she literally is an acts like a 2-year-old even though she's an adult or close well she's like she's a child but not like to the level of child mentality that she has. Um, and it just goes to show more that this Claymore organization just experiments and experiments and experiments on people. And, I, you know, I'm thinking more so that the Claymore organization isn't necessarily, um, they, they aren't necessarily, I, I guess, uh, what I was trying to say, like setting up things in order to like, like unleashing the Yomas themselves and then unleashing the Claymores to, to kill them. And then kind of like doing this whole plot organization thing. Uh, now I'm thinking it's literally just like an experiment after an experiment to see how much they can play with this idea of creating the greatest warrior, creating the strongest warrior that they can control in a way. So like, you know, to in order to overcome all of the awakened Yomas is to kind of have something to counteract it and to be just as powerful. So... Uh, so really, you know, between uh, Alicia and Beth, they're number one and number two, and between uh, the Miata character and between like the other experiments that they've done along the way, it really seems like they're just trying to have the strongest possible warrior that they can control. And whether for that's whether or not that is for some sort of overall objective or some sort of like global. Um, um, you know, quest for power or quest for dominance or anything like that has has yet to be seen. But uh, yeah, that's that's the thing. They've never stopped doing. They've never stopped just twisting the knife and experimenting as much as possible. And I think that that's pretty much that they're all kind of like just mad scientists. Basically, they're just trying to see how far they can push what they already know about the Yoma capabilities and how far can they push it and then still like maintain a stranglehold over it. But yeah, I'm definitely enjoying the multiple plot threads that are happening right now within the story. Uh, I'm a little bit more than halfway through, I believe, and so I'm wondering of how they're all going to tie in and they're all going to meet up together. I mean, I'm assuming, I, I pretty much know that Priscilla is going to be the final antagonist, the final boss of the series, so we're building up to that. Um, whether or not Raki comes back into the story, like I said, I hope he comes back in as just an absolute badass. Hopefully we will see that. And, uh, you know, whatever's happening between Miata and Clarice as well, uh, I, I'm wondering how far that's going to go or if, uh, if Clarice will get any sort of, like, semblance over her own sanity or if, if she will just, you know, continue to be, like, feral childlike. So, yeah, I think the biggest thing for me right now is just wondering how Priscilla, Isley, and Raki are going to come back into the story. I think that's the group that I'm most curious about. Um, and they weren't touched on really within these two volumes. So I'm just wondering where they're at, what they're doing, what the current status is, and just seeing where the story can go from there. So yeah, guys, so let me know your thoughts down below. If you've read volumes 12 and 13 of Claymore, what did you think of this portion of the story? What did you think about the time skip? And then let me know without spoilers, does the time skip like benefit the story really well? Because seven years is a pretty big gap. And I'm assuming a lot of that probably has to do with aging up Raki, but I could be I could be wrong about that. I'm not sure. Uh, but anyways, let me know all that down in the comments below. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and I'll get some more Claymore reviews out to you guys as soon as I can. Other than that, guys, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll talk to you next time.